This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. We're here today in Los Alamos in the office of Dr. Art Morse, who is the head of Cognitex LLC, a research company doing fabulous things in the realm of artificial intelligence and other things that he's going to talk to us about today. Dr. Morse is a former Los Alamos National Laboratory consultant to the Super Conducting Technology Center. He was also chief scientist at Hughes Micro Microelectronics Center. Um, and he has his Ph.D. in physics from the University of Southern California, as well as his undergraduate graduate work from the New Mexico State University uh, down in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And we're very honored to have him as our guest today. Dr. Morris, thank you for coming on the program. Oh, you're ever so welcome, Carol. Today we're going to talk about artificial intelligence, which, which is a subject that Dr. Morris is well versed on. What is there about artificial intelligence that interests you? Well, the potential for improving human, human life throughout the world is, is, is just tremendous. You know, uh, a couple of centuries ago, the Industrial Revolution uh, made it possible for for a, basically a machine could do what hundred, took hundreds of people to do, ditch digging and so forth, and you see the machines out working all the time now. We're just getting to a point where machines are getting intelligence. So intelligent machines and the idea of artificial intelligence. You know, the term artificial intelligence uh, was coined back in the 50s, and they've recently celebrated the, the the 50th anniversary of the term, and the idea has been that uh, adding, you know, as computers came along, you could add intelligence to machines, and intelligent machines would be able to do things that that could make another huge step improvement in in the essentially the quality of life of of mankind. I uh, failed to mention in, in the introduction that uh, you hold a PhD in physics um, from USC and you also did your undergraduate work at the uh, New Mexico State University down in Las Cruces, New Mexico, um, that you were a former, that you are a former Los Alamos National Laboratory consultant to the Superconducting Technology Center and a uh, former chief scientist at Hughes Microelectronics Center. So you have a, a very background, um, and, and um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned uh, briefly before we started the interview that um, your um, eating is about 600 calories a day uh, as part of a program to extend life. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, you know, the, the experimenters were looking at the impact of calorie restrict, restriction and they had something they called undernourished but not, not malnourished and a lot of the early work was, was with rats and so forth and they found that that if if you're fairly not just a little bit but really really substantially undernourished that that your life expectancy could increase as much as 30 percent 30 to 40 percent now they the earliest person that did work in that area was a UCLA guy named Ray Walford. But now there is a uh, substantial group of people that, that are attempting to, to get on that kind of regime and extend their life to the point where uh, other things going on. There, there is an organization called the Methuselah Institute, which uh, is headed by a guy named Aubrey de Grey, and they are looking at, at things that will not only slow down aging, but actually reverse aging. So what people in this program are trying to do, and the, one of the best known names on that is a guy named Ray Kurzweil, is extend your life to the point that for us, for us older people, to the point where some of these new strategies 
will actually become viable and can then start to reverse our aging. So that's, it's a little bit of the, what might be called pie in the sky, although pie is not <laughs> the best word. Uh, so, and it's, it's, it's been shown to work very effectively, monkeys, everything. Now the human database is limited because we live so long. So, but there's a good chance, and every day they're getting new information about what exactly are the mechanisms. How does your body change when, you're, when your calorie intake gets down to, to the six or 800 category? The average person on the earth eats roughly three times more than they really need. But it's, it's, it's not easy to, to restrict yourself to that much. You kind of have to get used to being hungry. How long have you been uh, on this program? Uh, only about three years. I was, I was reading about it and was up, up on it for, for 30 years. What Ray Walford was doing a lot of his things at UCLA 20, 30 years ago. But I only got serious about doing it to myself about uh, maybe four years ago. And then I started lowering it. And then I found out I'd, I'd lower my income, my diet, and my weight would drop rapidly for two or three months and then level off far above where I wanted to get. So eventually I, I, you know, I, I got it down. And eventually after you're on that diet long enough, you, your cravings go away. You don't really notice that you're, you're not eating very much anymore. How do you notice your energy level? Uh, I think it's about normal, you know. I, you feel pretty good. Well, yeah, you know, you, you have to be, avoid the malnourished part, which means supplements. It's all difficult to get all the, all the nutritional value. You know, you don't have fish oils. You don't have all kinds of things uh, unless you take supplements. But if you take the supplements and you have to, to, to do fairly regular exercise. Now, several times a week we play pretty cutthroat table tennis. And I lead, I, I lead or co-lead the senior hiking, and we go hiking up in the mountains every Friday. So, so it's, exercise is very important. And then, of course, they've shown a lot that the interplay of physical exercise and mental exercise is extremely important. And blood flow to the brain gets, gets accelerated by physical exercise. And, of course, you're, you're, you can actually grow new neurons and new synaptic gaps, new, a new synapse well, new synapses, uh, if you use your brain a lot. So I do a lot of mental exercising with computer games and, and so forth. That's great, and that's enabling you through your company, Cognitex, to do this important research that you have been doing on um, artificial intelligence. If we could get back to that subject, um, uh, what, what else would you like to tell our viewers um, about artificial intelligence and, and maybe um, the potential threats that that might cause in the future? You know, one of the things that has led to this concept of the singularity is the, uh, the observation that computers keep getting more powerful. Now, at, at present, if you, know, if you want to know how good is, how, is your computer better than mine or not? What are the metrics you use? You talk, you talk about how many floating point operations per second. Now there was a lot of news uh, when, when the, the uh, big new computer came up here to Los Alamos called the Roadrunner, and they talk about pay-to-flop computing. Yes. Okay, well that, that uh, there's something called Moore's Law that, that has had that every 18 months roughly, plus or minus a little bit, the computing power of, of, of computing chips doubles. And they predict that was gone for another 10 or 12 years. Now, other people in cognitive science have kind of looked at how powerful is your brain. And the people that are doing that are saying the brain is equivalent to, to maybe a million petaflops. And now if we back off and look at how long till we get to a million petaflops doubling every 18 months, uh, that says that by, by 2030, 2035, in, in, that, in those terms that computers will be, have more processing capability than, than people do. So that is what encouraged people to, to come up with this concept, of, this concept of, of this cognitive singularity. Will there ever be a time, and that was basically the question, will there ever be a time where computers are smarter than we are? That could be a big danger. 
Well, it could be a, a huge opportunity. It could be a huge danger because the, 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 the danger tends to be something that could be easily controlled, but it takes a lot of political will to control. And the dangers relate to the fact that intelligent machines do the work of people. When you do the work of people, it's almost the same as offshoring, ex except, you know, as soon as computers can do things cheaper than Asians can or, or some of the other Bangladesh uh, low-priced labor places, then, you know, business, in order to, be, to work with their shareholders, basically needs to say, okay, we'll do that. Well, I can hire, I can hire a intelligent machine to do the work of 10 people and only, only cost me such and such. So we, we put a lot of people out of work. Okay, now there, there, are, there are ways to make that good instead of bad. It's kind of, it's like there's a, a road to Shangri-La that has so many branches that go off, if we're not very careful, we won't get there. So what we're trying to do in, in, in understanding the, the possibilities and the options is make sure that we keep pointed down that road. Through uh, Cognitex, your company, what sorts of things are you doing? What are you researching? Well, there, there is a very specific thing. We, we think that an, an intelligent machine needs to be able to reason the same way we do, and that's called associative reasoning. Whenever you, you say there's something you're trying to think of, if, you, if it doesn't come to the front of your mind immediately, you start thinking about th that context. Well, what else did I do yesterday or whenever, the, whenever it was? What did that have anything to do with something else? So, so uh, conventional computer architecture and the conventional computer architecture is called the von Neumann architecture. It's something where you have like street addresses, you have, a, you have an address and then you have the contents at that address. If you want to find out, if you're looking for something that's in one of those homes, uh, you, you basically have to, to enter the address and then and examine what's there. If it ain't there, you have to enter the next address and examine what's there. Now there's a form of, of memory called contents addressable memory and I'm familiar with that because that was part of what we were doing at the Hughes Microelectronics Center. We were doing contents addressable memory development for for us, uh, uh, well, so for some classified surveillance organization purposes. Uh, but there was, there is a way to examine the contents of these locations without separate addresses. So contents addressability is essentially the. Uh, it's at the forefront of what Cognetics is trying to do. Oh, I see. And I understand that you're putting together the first summit uh, to, come to, to, to come to Santa Fe, just south of us, uh, ne sometime next year. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, we, we, this first one we call Cognetics Summit 09, with the idea that it would be a 10, 11, and 12. And we're, we're putting this together to, to look at what, if anything, is missing on the road to, to, to the, the intelligent machines. And one of the questions, of course, is how important is associative memory and is the contents addressable memory thing that Cognetics is doing, is that something that is, is kind of important or extremely important? And then there's another big question of metrics. They measure how good people are with IQ. Now, if you, you measure how good machines are with petaflops, and there's a big gap in the middle. And as, it, as intelligent machines evolve, so to speak, or, or design their next generation, we don't have a very good way of, of, of saying, is, 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 is this thing improved a little better? Is it dramatically improved from the, from, from the previous generation? So, so one of the major sessions of the Cogtech Summit will be coming up with new metrics. Now with computers, one of their oldest metrics was called whetstones. You run programs like you run Adobe Photoshop and see how quick it can do a job. And you can say, okay, well this, this particular hardware, software, whatever peripheral setup does this particular Photoshop job 20% faster than that one does, or 30%. Well, these are okay for some things, but for something like an inference engine, something that works the way humans do, and they're trying to figure out, uh, 
you know, how the world should be run. You know, we have in mind that someday machines will reach a level of intelligence that, and, and the breadth, it's not just the level, but the breadth of intelligence that it will be almost indistinguishable in, in advising uh, the politician, advising the president as to, as to what makes sense and what doesn't. Particularly as things get more complicated, there's something called unintended consequences. If you're, you're, you're examining uh, a segment of the future that doesn't include enough, then, uh, then things may happen that you had no idea what happened until it was too late to do much about it. Well, it's kind of exciting and scary at the same time. Um, what kinds of individuals will be coming to the summit? Uh, and will they be coming from the U.S. or all over the world? Uh, to your summit next year. Now this summit is it's a workshop rather than a, a convention or, or a conference and we're talking about maybe 50 people. What types of people? And they, they will be, uh, uh, of course we, we would like to get some of the leaders in, in information technology, the chief, chief information technology officer at, at Microsoft, at Google, other places sure. where they're looking at See, one of the things we can do with content addressable memory is, is find things that have not been pre-indexed. If you say, I can, I can read off a few lines of poetry from the middle of The Raven, and you can probably tell me, well, that comes from The Raven, and that would buy Edgar Allan Poe. Right now, if you into that in Google, you're just out of luck. Because all the search engines are based on things that have been pre-indexed. And the huge structure, infrastructure of Google spends a, a large amount of time going through and indexing things. And they're indexing things by what they think their, their clients, their users may be asking about. So, you know, anything about the flu, they probably indexed. But there, there are many things that haven't been indexed and CAMs can do that. You can have the whole Library of Congress on nothing, uh, you know, the, the physical size is a little tiny box, the whole Library of Congress. And you'll be able to find any, any quotation embedded deeply in any book, in any text, with that kind of, a, with that kind of an architecture. Amazing. And so, um, so the kinds of people that will come to, to your summit and, and try to, to address a lot of these issues would, would be IT types and other kinds of scientists? Engineers. Well, of course, we want to, there's, there's something, the people that are kind of bought into the concept of the singular, the singularity are called singularitarians, and we think we'll have a few of those at, at that point. I'm one of them, for instance. There's another group, it's called the transhumanists, that I'm also a member of. Transhumanists? Transhumanists. And transhumanists, the question kind of is, uh, how far do humans have to evolve before they're not no longer homo sapiens? They're homo superiors or so, homo something. But if, if, if at some point, humans, if, if we're able to genetically engineer our brains to develop in a little different way, a little more completely, there will be a point where, where we can legitimately be said to, to no longer be humans, not, not, in, a, you know, not in, in a negative sense, but we have transhuman capability. Now, in the much nearer term, there's a lot of work going on now in terms of, of actually implanting things in the brain. You implant things in the brain that can, can make your, your arm, you've had your arm blown off in, in, in the war and, and so forth. So they're, they're implanting uh, chips in the brain. The chips have little tendrils that reach out into, into the, all the local neurons and they, they've recently on PBS and other programs, they've demonstrated, they had a, a, a lady that, that basically was uh, the only way to communicate to the outside world is with, with her eyes. And she did have a little tiny smile, but she could communicate with her eyes, and they put this brain implant in her, and, and they showed her wheeling a wheelchair up and down around the halls, which just thought. And they've okay. done, done, a, done a lot of work leading into that, of course, with animals. They have monkeys that they, they had, had an artificial arm, and they, that didn't take long before they take the real arm of the monkey and, and restrain it. And, and the monkey would send the same signals as to his arm, but they'd be intercepted and sent to the fake arm. And the monkey was able to do all kinds of things with his artificial arm and so forth. So, so in that area of, of, 
of cognitive assistance. We may have an implant that allows us to communicate back and forth to our computer at home or over the internet or something. If we have a question, uh, we just, just uh, without appearing to do anything, make that connection and get the answer. You're really drawn to all of this just incredibly intelligent, um, new, new kinds of thinking, new kinds of research. And I guess you, do you have colleagues that you collaborate with on these things? These well, subjects? Are a fair number. We have, we have, in the area of manufacturing hardware, we have a, a company in Colorado Springs that we're working with. And they're deeply into to de designing integrated circuits and, and producing them and working with foundries and so forth. You know, another years ago, right after the uh, the the computers began to look like they're going to get smarter and smarter and smarter, a guy named Turing came up with a test, and it's called the Turing test, which many of the people that have been in the business know about, which is. The way we determine when machines are smarter than people, or at least they're comparable in, in, to people, is we, we, have, we have presumably a fairly intelligent person talking to a machine in a computer. And, when, and the talking doesn't have to be uh, verbal. It, it, you know, in the old days, everything you're doing it via teletype. But you, if, if you can't tell whether you're talking to a machine or a computer, then uh, that, that's what's called passing the Turing test. Now recently, a number of people, have, uh, a number of computers have passed the Turing test, but uh, now they're getting to a point where, where they have to dumb down machines so they, so you can't tell they're machines, because machines know too much. So the people were, were tricking the machine by asking questions that no human could answer, and when the machines did, they said, "Okay." <laughs> so there, there's. So much going on now. You know, Ray Kurzweil wrote a book called The Singularity is Near, and he has showed that, that knowledge is growing exponentially, almost the same pace as, as the, uh, the Moore's Law. That, that the, the, it's a situation where, where existing knowledge expedites new knowledge, and that results in, in mathematically speaking, that's called a differential equation. That, then that differential equation solution is an exponential. So each year, the curve gets steeper and steeper in terms of, of how, how quick things are accelerating. Right now, they're basically accelerating so fast that, that people can't keep up with them, and they kind of throw up their hands. A large fraction of the population just throws up their hands. Roger doesn't try to cover everything that goes on anymore. Or, <laughs> uh, Roger being Roger Snodgrass, the editor of the Los Alamos Monitor newspaper, who's uh, interviewed uh, Dr. Morse on a couple of occasions. And yes, there's just there's so much out there that you just you almost have to kind of focus. But uh, I was going to ask you, as a singletarian, um, I understand that that the thinking is that in 40 days, what's going to happen? Or I'm sorry, in 40 years, what's going to happen? Uh, well, it's, let, let me define the, the singularity is, mathematically speaking, it's where a function goes to infinity. But the one you're most familiar with is a black hole in physics. A uh, black hole has what's called an event horizon. And the event horizon, if you cross the event horizon, it's lost from this universe forever. Now, so the, uh, uh, the concept of an event horizon is partially why they talk about the cognitive singularity, because the idea what is that when machines can, when they're a little bit, when they're smart enough to, to design their next generation. You know, right now we couldn't begin to design a next generation computer without a huge amount of computer assistance. So when machines can design their next generation with none of our assistance, it's exactly as in the bomb world, when, when each neutron produces several times more neutrons, so the thing blows up. Well, this is basically the cognitive singularity, when machines uh, can move forward so fast that we can no longer keep up with them. That will be an event horizon from our point of view. And the question of what will things be like on the other side of that singularity, you know, in a religious sense, we can say we'll be left behind. So, uh, and then people worry about left, but what are they going to be doing when we're left behind? So there are a lot of huge questions about machine morality 
You know, are they are they going to form a, a zoo of us humans? Or just what <laughs> what the what does all this mean? Well, we we can't answer all those questions for quite a while, but there is as a really super excellent book, and it's called Beyond AI, that and I would strongly recommend to anybody that wants to look at the the kind of what needs to be done to to get a better idea of what life near or past the singularity might be. The, the author is a guy named Jay Storer Hall. And, and I, I recommend that beyond anything on that subject. Beyond AI, artificial intelligence. Yeah. And he has a, an excellent summary of what's happened since the coining of the term AI. And, and, but he, he looks a lot at, at machine morality. You know, and there's, there's something that, you know, in, in, in genomics, there are three branches of genomics. There's uh, structural genomics, which, which tells the genome how to build us or how to build a tree or how to build something. There's functional genomics, which tells it how to work after it's, after it's come together and, and the baby gets a pat on the back or whatever. Uh, that tells the internal how to work, to, tells the heart to beat. It has all kinds of stuff you're born with. But then that makes the, the, the organism function. And last, and this is a new discipline that I've been much involved in, is something called behavioral genomics. Behavioral genomics is related to the, the orgasm, the organism functioning in its environment. And you know, if it's a predator, how it can chase down its prey. If, it, if it's a, a, a bovine, they're, they're, they go hand in hand. That is, if a, if, a, if an animal isn't designed so its so its mouth can get easily to the ground, it's not going to be very successful at grazing. But it also it has to know how to graze. It has to know how to chew its lips. It has to know how to swallow. Well, that part of that's functional genomics, but the behavioral genomics. Now we have have a huge amount of behavioral genomics built into it. There are colonies of monkeys that different colonies of monkeys are so different in the behavior that, that it, it's almost unbelievable. How could that be the, the same creature? Their behavioral genomics is so different. If we were to, to design an animal, suppose you were to, going to design a pet for yourself, you want to be kind of like a cat, but certain things about cats you don't like. Well, the thing you'd be working on is, is the behavioral genomics of that animal. So the, the behavioral genomics, and this all is in, in the area of cognitive science. So this is the term cogtech, cognition technology, that we're, we're stringing together. Well, Dr. Morse, we're about out of time for this program, but I feel we've just scratched the surface of these fascinating subjects, and I wonder if you might come back on the program sometime in the future. I don't see why not. Thanks. Thank you. And I want to ask you if anyone out there is listening and, and is interested in finding out more about this or would like to find out information about your summit next year, how would they contact you? Well, we have two websites. I would suggest the Cogtech Summit, and that's just at cogtechsummit09.org. Okay. And, and for, as far as the company goes, it's Cognetics. LTD.com, and in that we discuss kind of what our plans are, what we'd like to see, and so forth. Great, Dr. Morris, thank you so much for being on the program. Okay, you're thank ever you so welcome. For, thank you all for viewing the program, and we'll see you again next time on Behind the White Coat: Conversations with Los Alamos Scientists. This program is made possible by the generosity of Los Alamos National Bank.